Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Connect Church Online. I am so grateful that you've decided to join us for worship today. Our community, as always, is blessed by your presence. If you haven't already said hello on our online platform, I would love for you to do that. Uh, it's always a blessing for us to hear from you. i uh, got a couple of announcements while you do that. Uh, the first is that our Connect groups are now in full swing for the spring. Uh, they're already going, but if you want to slide into a Connect group a little late, we would love to have you be involved in that. Also, our men's group is going to be going to Top Golf coming up really quick. The information for that is on your screen. If you would like to participate in that, uh, please reach out to us in the church office and we will get you down on the list to come and participate in that fun event. Uh, the other thing coming up really quickly is Mother's Day in just a few weeks. Uh, Mother's Day is always a fun event here at Connect Church. We do a, a muffins with mom thing and then we set up a big photo booth and that, so you can get actual printed uh, pictures with your mom. It's always a fun time. So be sure to bring your mom on Mother's Day uh, as we celebrate that together. It's always a wonderful experience. Other than that, I'm just glad glad you are here, and I'd like to invite you now to join me in saying the things that unite us here as a church family. Every week here at Connect, we join together, and we say these things together uh, because it reminds us that even when we are separated physically, we are still drawn together as a community by who we are and what we believe. So here we go. Here at Connect Church, our mission is to connect to God and connect to others. And our vision is to share the transforming power of Christ by creating a community set on making a difference in the world by living out Christ's three greats, the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The commandment of great compassion. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And while these are the things that unite us here at Connect Church, we are also united with Christians around the world, and so each week we join their voices in saying the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so very much for being here with us today. We thank you for your love and your grace. We ask that you fill up our hearts and our souls with your presence, that your spirit would be with us, enabling us to worship and be with you. In your holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. We're two or more are gathered in his name. He is there. Who run to him in faith? He is there. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There's power in his name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There's power. In
So if I could ask the children ages three through fifth grade to please head to the back at this time. Give it up for Chris. <laughs> All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring Through every season From where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises Fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Connect Church Online. I am so glad that you have decided to worship with us here. Uh, It's always awesome to me and the other folks who are here in person to know that you are out there worshiping with us online. So uh, be sure to say hello on the online platform, especially if you you are worshiping with us live. Um, We just love to hear from you. It's just uh, encouraging and a blessing to us. So today we are continuing on our sermon series called uh, Meltdown, where we have been talking about those times in life where we, guess what, melt down, where we have uh, these events where emotionally, spiritually, uh, uh, sometimes even physically, we are just overwhelmed. We are running on empty where our tank is, is out of gas, and we find ourselves in this place where I just, I don't have enough. And uh, we've been talking about some different times in the Bible where uh, that happened. Uh, we talked about Uh, different experiences that different characters had. And today we're going to do that again. Uh, But today we are going to really be focusing on the idea of being overwhelmed with uh, with sadness. Uh, sometimes we o- get overwhelmed with uh, responsibilities, right? There's just so much asked of us. We get overwhelmed. And we have this sort of meltdown. I, I can't do it on my own. Uh, sometimes we have more intense uh, meltdowns because we are facing consequences of mistakes we've made. Sometimes we make poor decisions, and as a result, we have to face the consequences of those poor decisions, and that can be a really hard thing as well. Uh, but today we are talking uh, about being in a situation where we are are just flat out sad. Uh, sometimes that's what happens. We uh, have experiences that cause a great deal of sadness, and sadness, as you are probably aware, is a pretty intense emotion that uh, can be overwhelming. And when we experience uh, intense sadness or, or mourning, uh, that can sometimes just cause us to melt down. So that brings me to my first point, which is that meltdowns are sometimes the result of intense sadness or mourning, right? They're not fun. Uh, they're not a, a, a great event. They're not this thing that we like to do. Very, very, very intense sadness can lead to a meltdown. And there's this weird concept in uh, that many people have about Christianity that we're supposed to, the Apostle Paul once, once said that we're to count it all as joy. And Apostle Paul didn't mean that we're never to experience sadness. And so there's this, there's this weird uh, misconception in much of the Christian church or by many Christian believers, that we are supposed to never uh, get to a place where we are just melting down with, with sadness or being overwhelmed because, uh, you know, we count it all as joy. And so Christians don't have to face that kind of thing. Now, or if Christians do face that kind of thing, it's because they don't have enough faith, right? They're, they, they don't believe in God enough or they wouldn't be melting down out of, of sadness or mourning or despair. And, and that's, that's just not right. Uh, there are people throughout the scripture that have this experience and sadness and mourning is just a part of the, the human condition. And sometimes we face situations or times where that happens. Uh, and the person that we're going to talk about today who had this sort of experience, a meltdown due to just overwhelming sadness, is uh, a guy that you're all familiar with. His name is Peter. He was one of Jesus's uh, disciples. He was actually not only one of Jesus's disciples, he was one of Jesus's like inner three disciples, right? This was his inner circle. And so Peter uh, makes this, uh, they're at the Lord's Supper together, and uh, Jesus is, is talking, and, and then they're, they're, uh, they're not actually at the Lord's Supper anymore, but they're, they're right around that time. And Jesus is talking to Peter, and they have this conversation, and it helps uh, sort of set the stage for when Peter has his meltdown. So this is from Matthew chapter 26. It says, on the way, Jesus told them, tonight one of you will desert me. For the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. So Peter makes this commitment to Jesus that he will never deny him, never never abandon him. Uh, All the other disciples join in. And Peter makes not only this commitment uh, to Jesus, Jesus knows better because Jesus knows what's going to happen, but 
but Peter makes this commitment to himself. I am not going to abandon Jesus. This is my mentor. Uh, this is my friend. Uh, this is the person that I have committed myself to. And so I will not, under any circumstances, be, uh, be abandoning Jesus. I won't do it. He sort of makes this commitment. This is who I am. And then uh, later that night, as you know, Jesus is arrested, and we get the, the rest of this story. Uh, I'm going to read this part out of Luke. This is in Luke 22. Then they seized him, him being Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looking closely at him, said, This man is also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I feel so bad for Peter here. He he makes this this commitment that he is going to uh, that he's going to stick with Jesus and and do the thing that he's supposed to do. He makes this commitment not only to Jesus, he makes this commitment to himself. And and Peter just breaks down. He he's afraid. Uh, he doesn't want to be injured himself. He he's afraid of being recognized or called out. And so he denies knowing Jesus. He, he abandons him. And then the scripture tells this story that the, the, the framing that this translation uses, which I think is pretty good, is that he went out and wept bitterly. Uh, there was this picture that was in uh, the, the church that I was a member of growing up, and it had this picture of, of Peter, you know, crying. And, and I always felt like it was a little bit too, like, formal. You know, it just looks like G- Peter's kind of crying in a classy way. Uh, I've seen a couple of pictures like this. And I've never really seen a picture that depicts Peter crying in the way that, that I picture him crying when I see that he's weeping bitterly, right? It's wintertime. It's cold. Uh, they've got a fire going. Uh, Peter is overwhelmed by his emotions. He he's, he's denies Jesus. He goes off and he hides. Uh, he wraps himself in his, his cloak or his clothing. He, he sort of is, I just imagine Peter just with the tears and the snot just kind of pouring out of his head. It's one of those cries where he can barely breathe in because he's, he's crying so hard and, and rolling himself in a ball because the insides hurt because of the, the mourning and sadness that he's experiencing. I, I just picture Peter with this sort of devastating experience where he's crying, uh, as the scripture says, bitterly. And oftentimes that's just not depicted, but I really think that's a more realistic picture of what Peter experiences. He experiences this meltdown. He has this, this time of intense sadness that is painful and overwhelming. And so he goes around the corner, finds a spot, curls up in a ball against the wall and weeps bitterly. And I and, and I just feel for the guy. I, I do. That, that sort of pain and suffering is, is, is just a terrible, terrible thing. And, and it brings me to reflect on that kind of meltdown for, for you and me today. We, we obviously weren't there with Peter, but, but we are a people who still experience the same types of emotions that Peter experienced and, and the same types of sadness and, and mourning that, that Peter experienced. And, and so I thought what we would do is we'd examine a little bit about Peter's experience and we talk about what we can learn from that experience. Uh, first of all, let's, let's talk about the types of sadness that we can experience uh, that leads us to this sort of meltdown. The first one is that sometimes we melt down because we are mourning our own sins or shortcomings. As I said, Peter lets down Jesus, and uh, I think what's even maybe harder on Peter in some ways is he lets himself down. He decided that he is not the type of person that is going to abandon Jesus. He will stick with him even if it cost him his life. He will be there, and it turns out that that wasn't true. And so Peter is devastated because he let down Jesus. He is devastated because it turns out he's not the person that he thought he was. And so he goes away and he weeps bitterly. And sometimes that can happen to us. Sometimes we screw up. Uh, our own sins, our own shortcomings, we don't live up to the standards that, that we're supposed to live up to, or at least the standards that we have for, for ourselves. And, and when that happens, 
when we let ourselves down, when we don't meet our own expectations, when we don't do the things that we say we are going to do, when that happens, it can be just a devastatingly sad experience to look at yourself and say, I'm not the person that I want to be, or I'm not the person at least that I even thought I was. I'm worse than that. Um, For Peter, I'm I'm not brave. I'm not committed. uh, I'm not faithful to God in the way that I thought I was. Now, just to say it, I don't blame Peter here. Uh, Peter is in a outrageous situation, and um, Peter is afraid, and Peter is confused, and Peter breaks down, and I wasn't there, and I know I've sometimes let myself down, not lived up to my own standards. So I have no judgment about Peter. Mostly what I feel for Peter is, is empathy. That by not doing the things that he had decided he was going to do, that, that was, he decided what was right and wrong, and now he had done what was wrong, and the sadness of realizing that he had let his friend down, his mentor down, that he wasn't the man he thought he would be, that sadness was overwhelming. And so he goes in a corner and weeps bitterly. So that's, that's one type of sadness, is, and, and there's more, but there's the, the two types we're going to talk about. That's one type of broad sadness, is the type of sadness that comes on simply because we do something wrong, and, and we realize, I've screwed up. And, and that could be a, a really intense place emotionally and, and a state of mourning. The other type of sadness is, is this, is that sometimes we melt down because we are mourning extreme loss. Losing someone uh, due to death um, is a really intense type of sadness. Um, depending on how sudden it is, depending on how close we are to the person, uh, depending on how, how painful the loss is, uh, losing someone that you love is, is, is just a really intense um, experience. And we experience that kind of sadness from time to time. Even uh, things like a divorce or loss of a dream or some sort of failure or a loss of a job, all of these things are types of sadness that, that come on due to loss, right? We, we lose something, someone or something, we lose something. And depending on how severe it is, we will experience different levels of sadness when we lose somebody. And, and so Peter, poor guy, he's experiencing both these things. He's not only uh, sad and mourning because Peter's smart enough to know that Jesus is on his way to death, right? He's, he's losing Jesus. Jesus is his friend, uh, his mentor, his, his commitment is there, and, and, and he's losing someone that he holds most dear. He's watching them go to their death, which is awful. And then at the same time, Peter is also experiencing this uh, thing where he let down Jesus. Like, he's not there for him in the way that he meant to. He's not the person that he meant to. And so Peter's got this crazy mix of sadness because he's mourning the loss of, of someone he loves, watching him go to death and there's nothing he can do, and mourning the loss of not standing by him and, and realizing who he is. Uh, it's really just, I really feel for Peter, it's just a really terrible situation, which is why he's there melting down, right? Now, sometimes, as I said, people feel like if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to melt down. And once again, I don't think that's right. I think that sometimes sadness is intense, but it's a part of what we're supposed to experience. Let me, let me expand on that. Is, that. is that mourning is a healthy step in the process of healing. We live in a culture where we spend a lot of time and energy avoiding the feelings of, of sadness, guilt, or, or pain, or mourning. We set all kinds of things up in our world and in our daily lives to avoid feeling those things. Um, we, uh, even like funerals, I've, I've been a part of uh, funerals in, the, in recent years, and I've noticed a trend in recent years in funerals where they don't call funerals funerals, they call them celebrations of life. And, and I'm not against calling them that if you want to. Uh, there are many people that I've gotten the opportunity to do funerals for where, who lived amazing lives, and their lives should be celebrated. It's an, it's an awesome thing to sit down and celebrate their lives. But as a part of losing someone that you love or a part of uh, sinning and, and realizing that that sin did something in the world, we should experience sadness. When we have someone in our life that we lose, that we love, experiencing the sadness and the loss that comes with that is a part of the human experience. It's, it's something that we should do. Uh, in human history, 
there, especially in the day of Jesus, they would have uh, these times where they would gather together and have these gatherings, and all they would do when, when someone died is that they would cry together. They would mourn together. They would weep together. They would spend all of this time just experiencing the sadness that came with the loss of losing a loved one. Uh, in the Christian tradition, we have, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago in the Christian church and, and before that, there was a tradition in Uh, Christian churches where we had this pew that was designated in the church. It was called the mourning pew, and it was the pew that you would go and sit in if you wanted to go and have a time of mourning, where you were to mourn the sins that you've committed, the things that you've done wrong, the ways in which you let God down or let yourself down or let down the people that you love. You would go and you would say, I have sinned, and you would be sad about it. Now, I I don't think that we should, you know, spend our lives being sad as Christians. I, I don't think that's the way that God intended. But I do think that we are supposed to experience sadness. And a lot of times in, in our culture today with uh, distractions that we put in place, uh, with things like celebration of lives and, and those sorts of attitude, we have put ourselves in a place where we are trying to rush through the process of feeling sad and go to immediately to the process of being, everything's fine. And that's just not the way that, that God wants us to do it. Because as I said, mourning is a healthy step in the process of healing. That in order for us to be healed from the sins that we've committed, we have to be able to realize how sad it is that we've done these things wrong. That we've hurt people. We've hurt people that we love. We've hurt our relationship with God. We've hurt ourselves. And we should be sad about that. It makes sense to do that. And and it is only through experiencing that sadness that we begin the process of healing. When we lose someone we love or have a major event of loss in our lives, we should have a time where we are sad. Embrace that sadness. Experience that sadness. It's an important part in the process of healing. Now, I'm not saying that you should live there forever. That's that's not what I'm supposed. It's not what we're supposed to do. But as human beings, we have to experience that sadness. That's the way that God designed us, so that we can move on to a place of healing. When we fall short, when we sin, we should experience that sadness. We should realize I've done something terrible. It's sad. When we lose someone, we should realize this hurts, and we should be sad. And whenever we're having that sort of meltdown, that that emotional moment where this is this this is so sad. I'm so sad. This hurts, and I'm crying. Our instinct shouldn't be to end that sadness as quickly as possible, as miserable it is, it is, it is. Our instinct should be to allow that ourselves to experience that sadness, but knowing that it is a peace on the way to healing. And, and that's the way that God designed us. And so when Peter is there in the corner crying and being sad, frankly, he should have been. He's losing someone that he loves in Jesus He's, he's uh, gone back on his commitment that he made to God and himself. He should be sad. And so it was right and good for him to spend that time being sad. And sometimes it is right and good for you to spend time being sad. Jesus can't help us move forward if we can't acknowledge the pain that we've endured or the pain we've caused. We have to acknowledge that. And the way that we do that is to be sad when sad things happen. Christians are not supposed to be happy when sad things are happening, right? Not only, we should be sad when sad things are happening. Make sense? And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but, but here's another reason why I want you, to, want you to realize this is so important. Only healed people can reach their potential. You can't be as awesome as God created you to be. You can't be a blessing to the people that you love and serve in God's kingdom if you are walking around with open wounds. I know a lot of people that walk around this world with open spiritual wounds. And when you ask them how they're doing, they will respond by saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. (laughs) The thing is, God doesn't want you to be fine. God wants you to be awesome. God wants to use you to make the world better, to teach the people around you about love and grace, to use you to resist evil and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. God wants you to experience great joy as you live out your purpose doing this. God wants you to be doing awesome, not fine. God wants you to, God wants you to use you to make the world better. And in order for God to use you to make the world better, you have to be fully healed. 
And in order to be fully healed, a part of the process of healing is to experience sadness. And all that's to say that sometimes when we experience uh, great meltdowns and great sadness due to loss or mistakes or whatever, we have this extreme sadness pushing down on us. It's okay to be sad for a while. And by being sad for a while, we are working the process of being healed. Okay? Now, here's the next thing, is that God likes to use people who went through a meltdown to change the world. Poor Peter went through this meltdown. He, he must have felt like he was two inches tall when Jesus turned and looked at him after he denied knowing him. He must have felt like God would never use him for doing anything again. He must have felt absolutely devastated and worthless. And then after the resurrection of Jesus, when he shows up and talks to the disciples, he goes to Peter and says, Peter, I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to feed my lambs. I want you to be the leader of the new Christian church. You're going to be the first pope. <laughs> and the scripture doesn't say uh, much about uh, Peter's emotional state or his response to that right away. But, but Peter, I, I just can't imagine Peter not at some point feeling a little inadequate, feeling like, I denied you. I'm not good enough. But Peter had gone through the process of mourning and sadness. Peter had been forgiven by Jesus. And because of that, God likes to use people who have gone through that process and been healed to change the world. And all that is to say that, that if you've been at a time in a, in a state of meltdown because of extreme sadness in your life, God wants to use you to bring good things to the world. That's the kinds of things that God likes to do. When Jesus died on the cross, that was the saddest thing uh, that, that maybe had happened to humanity at that point. The, the murder of the most innocent and gracious man who had ever lived was a very sad thing. And when that very sad thing happened, God then used that very sad thing to bring about goodness in the world. Which brings me to the next point, is that God does not discard broken people. God redeems their experiences. At the core of what it means to be a Christian is that we believe that when Jesus died on the cross, it paid for our sins. And in order for us to be forgiven to our sins, we turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help. Please forgive me and help move me forward. And this is where it gets crazy. This is, what, this is where what God does is incredible. Not only does God forgive us for our sins, and not only does God heal us through times of sadness, okay, the, those events are actually redeemed. And let, me, let me explain. So uh, say that you had an experience in your life where you had this, this moment of, of just terrible sadness that, that came upon you, like Peter. You screwed up and it made you very sad. And you just had a meltdown looking at yourself, right? It was awful. And what Jesus does is instead of just saying, I forgive you, Let's just forget about it and move on and never talk about it again. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. Let's just move forward. Jesus actually does forgive us. But that moment of, of meltdown, Jesus can actually take that moment and use it to bring goodness and light to the world. Once again, when Jesus died on the cross, it was terrible, awful, sad, sad thing. But now all around the world, Christians hang up crosses. You know, we've got one here and one down here. We, we hang up crosses in churches. We do, we do all of that because we point to the cross and say, this terrible, tangle, terrible, awful thing that happened, God redeemed this to bring about goodness. This terrible, awful thing that happened now shines the light of hope into the world. And the terrible, awful thing that happened to you whether it was a loss or a, or a, a great sin that, that caused suffering in the world, whatever, whatever happened to you that brought great sadness, Jesus is not only healing you from that, Jesus also wants to redeem that event to shine light into the world. Those of you who have gone through divorce, God can use that event to shine light in the world. Not that it was a great, exciting, fun thing, but the way that Jesus works is that that sad thing can bring light to the world. Those of you who have, who have lost people that you love, you can use that event not as something to forget about, but allow it to be something that God can redeem to shine light into the world. 
No matter what you've experienced, no matter where, what sort of loss you've had or, or pain or, or addiction or event, whatever crumbling thing that's happened to the world, one of the great things that, that Jesus likes to do is to take those events and redeem them. We have um, uh, experience in this church with, with a lot of folks who uh, bring light to the world in, by redeeming their moments of darkness. And some of the most powerful and incredible testimonies that I have heard and, and some of the most powerful and incredible ministries that happen in this church aren't done by people who've just forgotten about the bad times and moved on to something else. It's done by people who have realized that those bad times can be redeemed and utilized by God to bring light into the lives of others. And so we live that way. And so, so let, me, let me summarize it. Let me, let me try to make it all make sense. Sadness is still sad. It always will be. Uh, and there's nothing that you can do about that. Loss is still loss. It's always going to hurt. When we fall short, that's always going to be unpleasant. And so, and so sadness is going to continue to be sad. And, and this sermon is not about avoiding sadness. This sermon is about doing sadness in a way that, that can still eventually bring hope. Doing sadness in a way that it's a part of our healing. Doing sadness in a way that Christians do it. And that's described in 1 Thessalonians. It says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And, and it goes on to talk, but, but the point is, is, that, is that in Thessalonians, we are told that it's not that we're not supposed to grieve. Sad things happen and we grieve. We should. We shouldn't avoid grieving. We should grieve. But when we grieve, we grieve, with, we grieve with hope. Knowing that whatever darkness has come into our lives, whatever hardship, whatever difficulty, whatever thing that we have faced, that can be redeemed. Whatever darkness, whatever difficulty we face, whatever, whatever tough thing we endure can be redeemed by God to bring light into the world. And because of that, when we are in the midst of a sad meltdown, we should be sad, but we do it with hope knowing that the future will be good, that God will redeem my pain, that light will come of darkness, that incredible, wonderful, good things will happen because God is still in control. And so we mourn, we should, whenever we're sad, but we do it with hope, knowing that in the end, love will win, and in the end, the light of Jesus will chase away the darkness. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now that we have heard the word of God, we do have a chance to respond, and we respond first with our gratitude. Um, your inclination is going to be to immediately begin clapping, but I want you to give me just a minute because Susan has shared some words that I'm going to share with you, and I want you to let me get through them before we clap, but we're going to clap very loudly, so just bear with me. Um, Chris and Susan Grove are very valued members of our community, and we love them so much, and Susan shared these words. Since Thursday, I've been proclaiming the praises to God for bringing Chris safely through the installation of a heart defibrillator that will shock his heart back into beating should it ever completely fail. In the interest of time, I cannot begin to adequately thank God for the staff, including orderlies, nurses, cafeteria workers, custodians, Dr. Varahan, Dr. Martindale, and others at Oklahoma Heart Hospital, and all of the financial supporters who dreamed this place into being the researchers who develop the life-saving hardware, the IT professionals who sit in front of computer screens during the late night hours designing and monitoring it, the professors, teachers, school secretaries who educate all of these people, the assembly workers who painstakingly connect teeny tiny wires that make up the device, the fast food drive throughs who provide high school jobs that motivate youngsters to be productive members of society, the attorneys who go out on a limb to advocate for old people with insurance providers, the insurance companies who amazingly make a dollar out of 99 cents, and so many others. But she would like to thank her faith family who believes in a God who hears and answers every whispered prayer, and a pastor who makes hospital visits and tells anxiety-reducing jokes. That is one way to describe them. And above all, Jesus whose heart breaks when our hearts are broken. So we are so thankful that Chris has had this procedure and that he can go on living a full life. So join with me in congratulating them. And 
on a larger scale, thank you, Susan, as well, because we don't always think about all the people and all the things that go into the little things that make our lives better. And so we need to be grateful each and every day for everyone around us that provides these services and helps us along. And even thankful for Adam's jokes, too. So <laughs> um, we also have the chance to respond by our giving. If you're a first time guest here at Connect Church, please feel no obligation to give. This service is our gift to you. But if you do consider Connect Your Home, please uh, give generously in the manner that you have been given by the Lord. And if you would, pray with me now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Chris's surgery. Thank you for everyone who was a part of that. Thank you for all the people we don't even know that contributed to that. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for the love and support that we give each other, for the prayers, for all of the things that we do in your name. Please be with us as we decide to give our gifts to you today, and please allow us to give in the measure that we have been given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for the gifts that you poured out upon us. We ask that you might take them and use them to serve your kingdom and your world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room and he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to them and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do it, remember me. And so for nearly 2,000 years, Christians around the world have gathered together to experience God's grace in this way. And we do it today once again, knowing that God is present and that we will receive God's grace. Let us pray. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours now and forever, Almighty Father. Amen. I'd like to invite a couple folks to come volunteer to help us serve communion today. Uh, and as those folks figure out who they are, uh, when you, uh, whenever it's your turn uh, to come and receive communion, uh, we encourage you to do it the same way that we always do it. Uh, you come forward, you place your hands out like this. They'll take a piece of bread, place it in your hand. You go ahead and consume that bread uh, and then get the small individual communion cups. But after receiving communion, uh, I encourage you to stop by one of the prayer rails. Um, today, I am feeling grateful. And so when I pray today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer of gratitude for the people in my life that God has given to me who bless me. For, the, sci for the, uh, the sun that is shining and the food that I have to eat, for the shoes on my feet and the, and the love that I feel from God's presence, I'm going to pray a prayer of gratitude. And I encourage you to do the same. This is God's table. He's invited each and every one of you. So please come as you fill in. No 
I'd like to invite uh, David Good to come on up at this time. You ready, Dave? Read David Good. <laughs> so David has been coming to church here uh, for a little while now, and he has come today to profess faith in Jesus Christ and to become a member of our congregation. And so I've got a couple of questions for you whenever you're ready. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you we're going to do this all together. So this is, whenever we do this, we renew our vows together, so you can all join in. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the, power, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Amen. Awesome. And do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And finally, I ask you as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Fantastic. And now I ask you, only congregation, do you promise to pray for David, to be there for him always, to support him in his faith journey, and to entrust him in your care? An appropriate response would be, we will. Yeah. Awesome. Give, let's, uh, let's have a moment of prayer. David, we thank you, God, we thank you so much for David. We thank you for his grace and love. We thank you for bringing him forward to be a part of our church family. We ask that you enable us to be a blessing to him as he is a blessing to us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Welcome, David. And please stand for our benediction. As you go from this place today, I encourage you to go with grace, knowing that no matter where you've fallen short, no matter what you've done, your God forgives you and your God loves you. So go in peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.